And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That's a good question. And they said to him, Well, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. <laughs> And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, which is on Jesus Christ. So when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what happened. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, my God, the Holy Ghost came on them. And how did we know? Because they speak with tongues and they prophesied. And all the men were about 12. Drop back to verse 2 because this is, this is what the Holy Spirit asked me to hang this message on. I want to go back to verse 2. I'm sorry, verse 2. Where he said to them, he posed this question. He, he, he interrupted the atmosphere with a piercing question that I want to present to this congregation today. Where he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And I want to use for a simple subject, the missing ingredient. Oh my God. I'm going to talk about the missing ingredient. Look at somebody and say, something's missing. Yeah, touch them again and say, something's missing. We're going to help you find today the missing ingredient. Father, bless me today to share your word. Uh, give me power of speech, clarity of thought, so that I can present a coherent and clear message to your people. But Lord, above that, anoint what I'm about to say. It's only the anointing that breaks the yoke. And so for every heart that is prepared, Lord, and can hear, allow them to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm ready. Let's do it. I want to talk to you about the missing ingredient. I will confess, I'm not really like a food connoisseur. I like eating, you can tell. I like eating, but I'm not really like a food Connoisseur, You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not an expert judge in the matters of food, right? I'm not an epicure, gourmet, or gourmand, or gracianoma. I'm none of those things. I just like eating. <laughs> if it's good food, if it's edible, I will sit there and I will eat it. But I do have friends who really are connoisseurs, right? They really do cook. They know how to cook. And here's the thing about it. When my friends sit down to eat, they don't, those people, who don't, my friends who are like real connoisseurs, they're chefs, they, they cook and things like that. When they sit down to eat, they don't just eat. They actually like analyze what they're eating. Anybody got friends like that? They don't just sit there and eat the food. While they're eating it, they're telling you what's in it <laughs> and what's not. Like they'll eat a piece of cake, uh, Catherine, and they'll be telling you, uh-uh, this, this, this ain't got enough lemon in it. I don't taste no cinnamon. <laughs> you know, this, this is missing something. And they can tell you what's in it. If they're eating a steak and there's some sauce on it, they don't just eat the steak. That's me. I just gobble it down. They're eating it, but they're analyzing it. They're dissecting. They're telling you what kind of spices are in it. They're telling you what's, what's missing. They're, they can, they're, those kind of people are so good at what they do, so professional, so, so into what they do, that they can eat something and they can tell you what's in it and what's not. They can taste it. Now, I don't know the difference. I'll just eat it. It tastes good to me. But because they have discriminating taste, and because they are connoisseurs, and because they are experts at this, they can sit down at a meal at something that I would normally walk right over, and they can tell you what's in it and what's not. And they can tell you what's missing. So Paul, in our text, He's a, he's a real church connoisseur, right? He knows church. And he's a specialist. He's an expert. He knows what the atmosphere is supposed to feel like. 
He knows what's supposed to happen when believers, believers gather together. He knows, for example, in a room like this, what's supposed to occur in a church atmosphere. So during one of his third missionary journeys, he runs across and he encounters these men that, call, that, that the Bible calls disciples. The Bible calls them disciples. They weren't just average men. These were what the Bible specifically calls them disciples. But here's the thing. It implies he encountered these men that the Bible calls disciples. But oddly enough, they were not really operating or functioning in the authority and the privilege of a spirit filled individual. That though they were called believers or disciples or followers, Paul was tasting saying, mm, something's missing. It, 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 it doesn't even say what it was that was happening that made Paul inquisitive. It didn't say they was walking in sin. It doesn't mean that they were doing something crazy. But, but he noticed immediately that something was missing, right? It wasn't about what they wore. It wasn't about where they lived. It wasn't about what they rode on. It was none of those outward things. I, I grew up in the holiness church. And in the holiness church, we emphasize what you look like on the outside. We emphasize what you wore. So if you wore certain things or you didn't wore certain things or you, uh, you, you, if, your, if your dress was a certain length or if you wore certain clothes or your hair wasn't colored or your lips were it, then those became outward signs that you were living in holiness. <laughs> because to us, we emphasize the outside. But, but Paul didn't point out any of those outward things that we would determine that makes people saved or not saved. Because the truth be told, you can't tell if somebody's saved just by looking at them. You can't judge the length of their skirt or the color of their hair or what kind of suit they wear and determine if that person is saved or not. You don't have the insight, the intuition, the ability to determine where somebody is in their relationship with God based upon their outward appearance. Because man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. But so, so none of those things were the issue. The issue in my mind was Paul is a discerning person. He's a connoisseur. He's taste testing and, and he's sitting down at a meal, as it were, and he's saying something is missing. And I emphasize the outward because a lot of times we can't tell when people are doing things if it's God or not. To be quite honest, we have become so desensitized to the spirit of the Lord, to whether it's God or not, that we mistake and think that somebody just because they have talent or ability that that must be the Holy Ghost. So if somebody gets up and sings a song that sends shivers up your spine, you think, oh, that's the spirit. Not necessarily. Let me slow you down. So if somebody gets up and eloquently speaks the word and makes you cry or makes you move or moves you in some way, we assume that must be the spirit. Not, not necessarily. And it's getting, it's interesting in this generation particularly because this generation seems to lack the discernment to tell if something is God or not. It wasn't like it was back in the old day when the old mothers would walk in the room and they could tell you right now that is not God and they make you sit down. See, we ain't got no old mothers around here right now. See, the old mothers could walk in because they spent time in prayer. They spent time with God. They spent time on their face. And when they walked into an atmosphere and you was up flipping and flopping and moving around, they could tell you right now, baby, that ain't God. You need to sit down. Oh, yeah, you ain't ready for the old school. So, 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 but, but we are fascinated with gifts. And so if somebody can speak or sing, or God help them if they have good looks, we say, oh God, that must be the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but, but, but let me help you here in your Bible understanding. Back a few chapters, back in verse 18, there, there was a young man called Apollos, and the Bible describes him specifically as somebody who was mighty in scriptures. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great eloquence. He persuaded many, but... He was still missing something. And I come to just tell somebody right now that if you are a real connoisseur of things that belong to God, that you have to develop a discernment because everything that's crying holy is not God. 
Everything that has an ectus around their neck or wearing a cross is not a Christian. And everything that has a sign on their door saying Christian is not Christian. And you have to be a discerning person to know. You can't be swayed by the way somebody sings or the notes that they hit or the tone that they do or the preaching that they do. That this You cannot assume in this day and age that the person that is standing next to you or sitting in front of you or speaking to you has a real relationship with God. You got to get a walk with God for yourself. Y'all not going to talk to me this morning. So, so Paul, Paul knew, Paul knew something was up, right? Paul, something was off because these men, because these men didn't exercise something that set them apart from regular people. Paul, Paul, Paul knew something about that because Paul himself had a real authentic relationship with God, Connie. Paul himself had been somebody who had had God knock him off his horse. Huh. Paul had been somebody who had heard the audible voice of the Lord. Paul had been somebody who had been spirit filled himself. Paul had been somebody who had been around many other Christians who were actually spirit filled and walking in the power of God. So he knew what the real thing was supposed to look like. How do I put it? Real recognize real. <laughs> real recognize real let me show you like this even in the world when we were unsaved and we was out in the world real will recognize real you could walk into a club or walk into not a club you could walk into a grocery store you could be in a classroom and you ever notice that you could pick up certain things I mean without having the Holy Ghost Charlene you could pick up certain things about people and you knew what that was and, and most of the time, especially if you had a certain proclivity, if you had a certain proclivity or a certain bent or a certain struggle or a certain background, say, in drugs or alcohol, and you were in that kind of lifestyle, you could be in a room like this, and I could pick out people who understood what that was. Because real recognize real. I could walk into a, come on, talk to me, somebody. That's why in a church setting, when people first come to church, they don't know nobody, but all of a sudden, without wearing a name tag or a badge or telling you their life, they will find themselves gravitating to certain people or staying away from certain people because real recognize real and you can look across the room. I ain't even got to know your name. I can just look at you and discern you and say she knows something about that. Y'all not going to talk to me. Why? Because that's been my struggle. That's been my issue. That's the thing I came out of. And so because that was my struggle, I recognize people who have that particular struggle or that particular issue because real recognize real. Look at somebody say real recognize real. You can't fool me. You can't trick me. You can't jive me. That's why when I walked into a club, I'm, I'm assessing the room. I'm looking around, and I'm saying, yeah, that's what that is. That's what that is. That's what that is. Stay away from that. Oh, that's cool. That's my homie. I ain't even got to know your name. Just something about I picked up from you without having the Holy Ghost. I just knew because real recognized real. So you mean to tell me that I'm going to get in church, and I'm going to have the Holy Ghost, and I can't recognize when somebody else got the Holy Ghost? <laughs> so, so Paul, because he had a real, authentic relationship with God, he understood what it's like to walk into a room with other people who had the same God that he had. Because ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Come on, that's what Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell sort of singing. Like. Ain't nothing like the real thing. Ain't no when you take a counterfeit and you put up against the real thing, I mean, if you got a real Gucci bag and you put up against a Uchi bag... You just strutting around with your Uchi bag, talking about it's the real thing. But when I pull out the real Gucci, you say, oh, no, that, 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 that ain't the real thing. Then when you put the real, but, but that's how some of us are. Because you've been so inundated with fake stuff, because you've been so inundated with imitators and imposters, when the real thing come in, you don't know the difference. But I want to talk to somebody who knows what the real Holy Ghost is. Holler at your boy if you know what I'm talking about. So I don't know. I don't know. Real recognize real. And he said, you're a believer. You're a disciple. You say you are. But uh, it prompted Paul enough to ask the question, um, have you received the Holy Ghost? 
I wish everybody out in the hallway would come on in here. I wish every volunteer that ain't doing it would come on in and get this word. I wish everybody who is not somewhere where they can't hear this word to get in here. I wish somebody would share this on your timeline and share with your friends because I'm about to dig down into stuff because, I, you know, see, see, a lot of stuff we pass on that the Holy Ghost is really not the Holy Ghost. A lot of stuff that we say is God is really not God. And see, I'm a weird person because, see, the way my Holy Ghost is set up, Yeah, yeah. When my Holy Ghost is set up, I can't stomach that stuff. I can't tolerate that stuff. I can't really get with that stuff. And a lot of stuff you try to jam down my throat and call it the Holy Ghost, I can't hardly get with it because I know that it's not really the real thing. Oh, y'all not going to talk to me. In the book of Revelation, God commended the Ephesians because they were people who would try those who called themselves apostles and they really were not. They were imposters. So don't tell me that I'm not allowed to judge. Because if the Ephesian church could do it, I know I could do it. And some of this stuff we call the Holy Ghost is not. Oh, they might not come back to this church. They might not visit me no more. Somebody done just clicked me off. Because somebody convinced you that because you can hit high notes, that that must be the Holy Ghost. Sit down. Somebody done told you because you got your hair cut a certain way that you're a preacher. Sit down. Somebody done told you because you got that preacher's head that you ought to be somebody's pastor. You know that preacher's head. They got that muscle in the back of their head. And they say he must be a bishop because he got a muscle. Sit down. There ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. When the real thing walk up in here, we ain't got to go through a whole lot of shenanigans and foolishness and backflips because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Everybody that appreciates God's anointing, give God a shout right here. Ain't nothing. Oh, I can't get happy yet because we got stuff to do. Sit down, sit down, sit down. So, so when I look at the state of the church today, I wonder if the Apostle Paul walked into our churches, if he would ask the question, do you have the Holy Ghost? Because the church looks so different than it was when he was here. It's so different in its energy, in its fervor, in its activity. It's so different. I believe the Apostle Paul walked in, he would be shocked at what we call church today. He would be appalled. He would be annoyed. He would be crazy, fascinated, saying, what is this? I believe, now that's just me. I'm just using my Holy Ghost imagination. I believe if the Apostle Paul walked into this church today, he would ask the question, do you have the Holy Ghost? Do, do, you, do you have this that I have? I mean, this thing that I have touched me so much and impacted me so much that I spent, he spent his whole life trying to unpack what happened to him. That something happened to Paul on the road to Damascus that was so strong that he wrote and said, I have not attained yet, but I follow after. I'm a God chaser. That something happened to me that was so powerful that it changed my life completely. So when I look at you and it didn't happen, I think, do you have the Holy Ghost? Y'all look uncomfortable. I believe if Paul walked in today and he saw how disinterested we are in prayer, he would ask, do you have the Holy Ghost? Disinterested. If we have a concert, a sing-along, a praise-a-thon, place will be packed. But if we call people to prayer, I see very few. And Paul would be shocked because the early church didn't have no music, no musicians, no singers, no choirs, and they were packed to the heels. So why is it now that we've been sold into the idea that we have to have a prayer? I'm not against music. I love music. But why are we sold into the idea that we have to have it in order for us to have the presence of God? Well, y'all not going to get me today. They had prayers, what they had, and they had churches that were growing daily. And Paul would be asking, do you have the Holy Ghost? If, 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 if Paul were to come in, uh, Charlene, and see our lack of fervency when we worship, no fire, no spunk, no energy. He would wonder, do you have the Holy Ghost? How about this? When Paul looks at how disinterested we are in the preaching of the word. See, I, see, I came up in the time, I came up in the time, Charlene, where you didn't walk during the word. Come on, Miss Connie. 
You didn't walk during the word. You might walk before the word. You might walk during the choir singing. You might walk during the offering. You might walk there, but you didn't walk during the word. Because that was the only, that was the moment that you knew that whoever donned the pulpit was going to speak something that you needed this week to fight the issues that you deal with, to fight the devils. And so when it came time for the word, it was, shh, don't talk to me, don't pass me notes, don't tap me, don't call me, don't be sending me pictures on Facebook. Don't, somebody had near to call me while I was preaching one time. God, they, I'm, my phone was sitting right here, call me. I thought I called them and said, why would you call me? You can't interrupt. I'm in church. <laughs> we didn't walk doing church. You might deal with some business before, unless it was some dire emergency that you had to leave or something like that. We just did not do that because we understood that the word, the same word that stood on the edge of nothing and said, let there be. And there was the same word, oh my God, that came in human flesh and walked among men and they called him Emmanuel. The same word that came into your life and changed your situation and turned your life around and saved you out of sin that word when it came time for the word we gave it respect we sat there with our notes and our pins and we got our fork and our knife out because I knew God was going to say something that I was going to need so we didn't play when it came to the word Angie you could play before church you could play after church but when it was time for the word don't send me no pictures don't text me don't Facebook me don't FaceTime me don't tap me on the shoulder don't be trying to have a conversation because I need a word how many people need a word today oh I'm gonna give you an opportunity to touch your neighbor right here touch your neighbor and say I need a word See, see, some of y'all just strolled up in church, but I came in church dealing with some devils and dealing with some demons and dealing with some issues and dealing with some crisis. And I know when I go to work on Monday, I got to deal with a crazy boss or a crazy spouse or a weird kid or somebody showing off. And I don't have time to play with you. I came to get a word for my life. Everybody that came to get a word, you've got to shout right here. So Paul would be shocked at how we handle it. He'd be shocked when it's time for the word to go forth and we're sitting in the lobby having useless conversations. He'd be shocked. He'd be shocked when we turn off the TV because we go into the other YouTube channel to find out somebody's business ain't got nothing to do with yours. He'd be shocked and even ask the question, have you received the Holy Ghost? Because this that I have. It's so powerful and life-changing. It'll give you an insatiable desire to get more. Uh, so, so, so where is or what is the missing ingredient? When you look in the book of Acts and you see how the church operated and functioned, when you look at the power that they had, when you look at the victory that they had, and you measure it up and you mirror up against what we see in church today, it makes you wonder, what's the missing ingredient? We're saying the same thing, but it doesn't mean the same thing as it did years ago. There's a missing ingredient. We still got our choir robes on. We're still singing the song of the Lord, but there's no power in it because something is missing. We're still singing the same Bible verses that we were before, only there is no impact, there's no change, there is nothing being affected because we are missing something. Oh, God. We're missing something that is so strong. I can come into church with issues and spirits and problems and sit for an hour and a half and go right back with the same issues and problems because something is missing. Oh, oh my God. There should be something that happens in the service of the Lord that you can't just get off of you when you walk out the door. There should be something about being in the presence of God that when you leave you can't just pick up a cigarette or pick up a bottle or call your girlfriend or call your boo thing. There should be something about being in the presence of the Lord that impacts you so much that it's going to take you a while to come out of this fall. Is there anybody that wants the presence of God so strong that it does something in your life? Give God a shout if that's you. Oh, oh my God facing you preaching too hard for him. Don't preach to him too hard, Hammer. Look at somebody said get this word get this word 
there's a missing ingredient. We, we, we have the same names on. We're, we're all still called disciples, but I'm tasting mm, mm, something. Something, something missing. Something, 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 something's missing. Some, some, some missing ingredient. I, I feel like one of my friends sitting at the table analyzing a piece of cake. It looked like a yellow pound cake. It looked like a pineapple upside down cake, but it ain't got no pineapples. You selling me on something that you don't even possess. You selling me on something that is not even in it. And how mad does it make you to buy something and say it's in there and it's not? Who is it, Prego? When they put the thing on the box, they say it's in there. <laughs> they say spaghetti sauce, everything is in there. The onions, the garlic, the whatever is in there. And you open that bottle, if it's not in there, don't it make you mad? <laughs> so if we're going to analyze the church, because I'm a believer in all things working. First thing I want to talk to you about is that we have to, if we're going to find the missed ingredient, we have to do an assessment. So write that down. Do an assessment. If you're missing something from your life, if you are a church attender, but your life is not being impacted, you need to do an assessment. If you're somebody who's been saved for a long time and you're not growing in the things of God, you need to do an assessment. If you're somebody who just came to church because my grandmother go here, but you don't get nothing out of the service, you have to do an assessment. If you're somebody who's out here who every time you get an award, you kiss up to God and say, Lord, I thank you. But everything about your life denies the God that you said you just thanked. you got to do an assessment. Oh, come on, talk to me, somebody. If you say that you're called to preach, but you have no desire to study the word, we got to do an assessment. If you say, I'm a worshiper, I'm a worship leader, and the only time you sing a song of the Lord is on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, all you listen to is secular music, and you know all the verses and the rhymes to the rap songs you sing, but you can't memorize the song of the Lord, we need to do an assessment. I'm, uh, am, am I talking too hard for somebody in here? We got to do an assessment. If you come in the church and look like the church mother wrapped up from your neck down to your knees, but on Monday you look like somebody walking on a stroll, we need to Just saying. When, <laughs> it's old school right here. When something is not working like it's supposed to, for example, your electronics, they do what is called troubleshooting. Right? If my camera doesn't work, if my TV doesn't work, if my computer doesn't work, I start doing some troubleshooting. I mean, I start going through a series of tests that get this. They're designed to determine what's wrong with it. If your TV go out, you don't just throw it out. The first thing you want to do is figure out what's wrong with it. It's supposed to function this way. It's supposed to work this way. And I'm not an advocate for throwing out the church. I'm an advocate for what's wrong with it. Because the goal is to make it operable again. The goal is to make it function like it's supposed to. And when it's not, you have to assess. Michael, you have to assess. you got to ask questions. And you got to look into possible solutions. You don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. You start dissecting it and start going through it and figuring out, I know it's supposed to be this way. I know it's supposed to have power. I know something's supposed to happen. But we got to figure out what's wrong. Somebody say, do an assessment. If something's wrong with your marriage, you don't just walk out on it. You got to do an assessment. What do we do wrong? Do we need to communicate? Do we need a vacation? Do we need to talk about it? You can't just throw it out. This is a generation that whenever something doesn't work, we throw it out. So four marriages later, you're still throwing them out and changing them like you're changing socks. Because your approach to everything is just throw it out. No less work on it, no less fix it, no less assess. You just throw it out. You just walk away from church, you walk away from God, you walk away from your business, you walk away from anything that's important because when it gets hard, you just throw it out and get another one. But sometimes you got to sit down and do an assessment so that it can work properly. Something's wrong. So when we want to fix things, sometimes you make it too complicated. I wrote this down, write this down, because this is what the Spirit talked to me. Because I realize I'm like this too. When we fix things, we want to make things work right. We make it too complicated. Here's what the Spirit said to me. He says, stop overthinking it. Stop overthinking it. That sometimes the simplest solutions are often the correct answer. That when something is wrong in your marriage, in your family, in your business, 
that sometimes the answer is a simple fix. You're making it complicated because you're overthinking it. So by the time you go on a workshop, a seminar, spend $9.99, fly somewhere, go somewhere, you have overthought it. You have, you have to have a committee meeting. Sometimes it's the simplest thing that could fix it. So when I look at the church and the complication with the church, there are some people who say, I'm not doing church no more. I quit. I'm not with it. They just threw out the whole thing and say, I'm going to be spiritual because they see no need for the organized church. So they want to throw the whole thing out. Somebody hurt me. Somebody did something wrong. Somebody did something that's improper. So we throw the whole thing out instead of assessing what needs to be corrected so that it can operate the way God intended. We overthink it. I remember one time, for example, if you, if you make a service call regarding, say, your, your computer, you don't throw the computer out. If you call the service tech, the first thing he's going to ask you is what? Did you plug it in? That's simple, right? I mean, you're ready to take the whole thing. I do this anyway. You're ready to take the whole thing apart, you know, disconnect it, pull out all these different things. But some, when you call a service tech, have you, anybody ever did it? You call the service tech, something's wrong with my computer. The first thing they ask is, did you plug it in? Because you'd be surprised the number of people who are ready to have a fit about something and the only thing wrong with it is that you didn't plug it up. So you're ready to throw away a $3,000 computer when all you had to do was plug it up. Maybe the plug don't work. Oh, God. We make it too hard. True story. True story. Am I boring y'all? Y'all getting something out of this? True story. I was working at home uh, one day, working from home one day, and, and, and the power went out. This is a true story, Connie. The power went out right in the middle of what I was doing. Just boop, everything went out. And in my mind, I assumed that the power went out in the whole neighborhood, right? It must be a power outage. TV went out, computer went out, uh, printer wouldn't work, everything just shut down. Boop. And I assumed that it must be a power outage in the whole community. So I'm calling the power people. And I'm trying to, I'm fussing too. Y'all get in the middle of the, what's going on? I'm trying to, how long is it going to take it? Da, da, da. So we went around and around about this for about 15 minutes. And finally the text said to me, Mr. Faison, there's no power outage in the community. The power outage in your house. You forgot to pay your bill. <laughs> True story. True story. So here I was, I was assuming it was something wrong with everybody. When the real problem was, there was something wrong with me. <laughs> some of us are the same. That's funny, but some of us are the same way. When you see everybody else around you getting a breakthrough, when you see everybody else getting what they need, and you want to blame it on everybody else but yourself. If you see everybody around you getting touched, getting healed, getting delivered, getting a word, getting what they need from God. If you see everybody else getting a breakthrough and you ain't getting it, you can't assume something wrong with everybody else. It's something wrong with you. And so sometimes people walk away from church and they say, the church didn't do nothing for me. I didn't get nothing out of the service. And you see, everybody else's face is lighting up around you and they're getting the word and they're getting touched and there's something wrong. But, but you're not getting anything. You got to do an assessment. Maybe something wrong with me. Maybe I need to get something right. In. Oh, so y'all don't want to do that. It's easier for you to blame it on the preacher. It's easy for you to blame it on the choir. If the choir sang better, I would have got a touch. If the preacher had preached better, I would have got a word. If they had loved better, I would have got something. All these folks here ain't got God. And everybody else is getting free but you. Then you got to be like me and say, it ain't the whole neighborhood. It's you. <laughs> is there anybody else that can say that, be honest? I mean, 100% that sometimes when you wanted to go off about something, it wasn't them, it was me. Even when it comes to family, sometimes it wasn't my whole family. My whole family crazy. No, just you. Just you. <laughs> you, you. See, we never want to put the spotlight on ourselves. We never want to assume that there's something wrong with us. We never want to do an internal assessment, check your Holy Ghost, figure out if you have a real relationship with God. What am I saying simply? Are you plugged in? If you're in a church like this and you're not getting a touch, don't say there's something wrong with us. You just ain't plugged in. I know you're not plugged in because when the worship leader said lift your hands, you act like you had two cinder blocks on your hands. 
I know it's not us because we were getting a touch. I know it's not us because we hear the Holy Ghost clearly. It might be you. I'm not saying it is, but it, are you open to the fact that it might be me? Look at somebody say, do an assessment. Because it's not an us problem. It's a you problem. I counsel couples a lot during my ministry career. And inevitably, somebody's always walking in saying it's them. It's her. She's the problem. If she cooked better, <laughs> if she gave sex more often, <laughs> if she respected me, <laughs> if she had a whole grocery list of things, it never, occur never occurs to him that it might be you. It might be the fact that you ain't coming home like you're supposed to. It might be the fact that you don't listen to her. It might be the fact you're disrespectful. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying we have to sometimes grow up and assume it might be me. Come on, I ain't just going to pick on the brothers. Sometimes the sisters are the same way. I don't understand him. He don't do right. He don't add that. We never assume that it's us. Look at somebody and say, it might be me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest and do an internal assessment. I'm going to at least take some time and sit down and go through my thought process, my life, my childhood, my decisions, and determine if it's me. It might not be me, but at least going to start and check if it's me. Maybe I'm not plugged in. Maybe, maybe the reason why you don't get nothing out of church is because you haven't plugged into your prayer life. Maybe. Maybe the reason why you don't get a word when the preacher's preaching is because you don't even know the scripture that he's throwing at you. You don't pick up your Bible at all until he says, let's everybody stand and read the word of God. <laughs> and so there's a disconnect when you come to church. There's a, I can tell. I can tell. There's a disconnect sometimes. Sometimes the worship team is up worshiping and the congregation is not getting with it. And there's a disconnect there because you haven't worshiped all week. And so now we got to try to do, Connie, in 15 minutes what you should have been doing all week. <laughs> so you want me to be so anointed that I step over your sins and your issues and the fact that you partied last night and you slept with whoever you wasn't supposed to sleep with and you acted a fool. Now I got to try to sing you over top of all that. You never assume it might be me. Oh. Am I coming too hard? This sounds like old school holiness church up in here. Because we, we can't get you to get there because we've been living in this hour all week long and you just did it when you came in. And so it might be me. Number two, they did an assessment. Let me talk about enlightenment. I'm almost done. There, I'm talking about enlightenment. Here was the issue. When he asked them, what's the problem here? He did the troubleshooting. They said, we have not heard if there be any Holy Ghost. So here's what I want you to understand. There's a direct relationship between what you taught and what you receive. Here's the problem. They had not heard of it. I, I ain't even heard about it. More specifically, more accurately, they hadn't heard of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They had not heard that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and thousands of people were filled with the Holy Ghost. They had not heard that there was an experience, that this was the promise Amen. That Jesus made that he would send them the Holy Ghost. They had not heard that women and children were prophesying under the power of the Holy Ghost. They had not heard that people were hearing them speak in their own language. They had not heard that the power of Jesus was indwelling in people and now they were laying hands on the sick. No, they knew Jesus did. They knew Jesus was laying hands on the sick. They knew he was raising the dead. They knew he was helping people get free. But they had not heard that the same power that was in him was now indwelling his followers. And they hadn't heard anything about it. And they said, we haven't even heard about that. What? You mean to tell me that God is moving over there like that? Who ever heard of it? They couldn't receive it. Here's the problem. They couldn't receive it. Because they weren't expecting it. Did y'all get that? They couldn't receive what God had for them because quite honestly, you wasn't expecting it. When some people come to church, you don't expect God to do nothing. So he don't. <laughs> it's important to us as believers and anybody who, who comes to a worship service that you have an attitude of expectancy. I'm expecting God to do something. I'm expecting to be touched. I'm expecting to get a word because here it is. If you don't expect nothing, you won't get nothing. 
And so I can tell you're expecting God to do something because I can feel the pull on you. When you walk in and you're lifting your hands and you're worshiping, you're creating an atmosphere. It's not just us trying to do gymnastics. We're trying to create an atmosphere where God can do what he do because there's somebody who came in there. Maybe you don't want this. Maybe this is not your word. Maybe you're not interested. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you got your boyfriend on your mind. Maybe you got your roast on the top. But for somebody they came in here, my mind was on Jesus. And so when I came in, I came in like an empty cup before a full fountain. And I need God to fill me up. I need a touch from the Lord. I need God to come into my life. If that's you, jump on your feet and say, Lord, I need you. Oh, you're not going to talk to me in here. Lift your hands right here and begin to say, Lord, I need you. I didn't come to play. I didn't come to see what you had on. I didn't come just so I can get dressed up. I came because I needed a touch from God. But you can't receive nothing you ain't never heard about. Exposure is everything, Adrienne. Whatever you're exposed to, it creates an appetite in you. <laughs> they had no hunger for this. They had no appetite for this. Therefore, they didn't receive it because they hadn't even heard about it. Here, there it is. There is the missing ingredient, Sharita. They didn't have no hunger or thirst for this. Jesus said, they is the hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. I'll tell you the people that's going to be blessed today are the hungry people. I realize that everybody in the room ain't hungry. We're hungry, but we're hungry for the wrong thing. Yeah, you hungry for another hit. You're hungry for sex. You're hungry for a job. You're hungry for a career. You're hungry for a whole lot of things, but you're not hungry for God. And so therefore, when we talk about godly things, you get bored. You get disinterested. You're hungry, but you're hungry for the wrong thing. So even though I came to church, my mind is not on church, and that's the missing ingredient. Oh, my God. If I had a room full of hungry, thirsty people in here, I wouldn't be able to finish preaching this message because we start flipping out and running around and jumping up and down and running around this church because I'm hungry. Somebody throw your hands up and say, I'm hungry. Ooh, he's animated. He is really, that preacher is really animated. I'm hungry. He's sweating and I holler. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry, Adrienne. I know what it's like to be hungry, but be trying to satisfy the hungry with something else. I know what it's like to be hungry, but you try to satisfy the hunger with something that doesn't help you. You need God, but you keep running to an alcohol bottle. You need God's love, but you keep trying to get somebody's sex. You need God's touch, but you keep having people touch you. They touch your body, but they don't touch your soul. Somebody say, I'm hungry. I'm hungry, and I'm tired of people handing me. Telling me it's God when it's not. I'm tired of you handing me half-hearted worship and half-hearted service when I need a touch from God. Sit down with your lazy self and let God speak. I'd rather have nothing than having somebody give me something that's not real. I'm hungry. Ooh, God, who am I talking to in here? Wave at your boy. That's why, that's why, that's why I got up this morning. That's why I got dressed. That's why I drove across town. I didn't come across town to see you. I came to see him. I came. I came. I came fully expecting Jesus to be in this place. I came fully expecting the power of God to hit this place like a bomb. I came fully expecting, and I'm so expecting of it, I'm not going to wait till the musician hit the organ. I'm not going to wait for the worship leader. I'm not going to wait for the preacher to tell me. I'm going to lift my hands right now and say, Lord, I need you. If you're wondering what the missing ingredient is in our churches, it's quite simple. You don't want him. You want what he can give you. You want the gift without the giver. You want the love without the lover. You want the blessings of God, but you don't want him. How, how, many, how many men in here would love a woman who wants your money but don't want you? Ain't nobody raising their hand. Because that don't work. But we treat God the same way. Heal me. Bless me. Give me a husband, 
give me a promotion, bless my business, but I don't want you, Jesus. I don't want you. And God's too smart to let you play him. There are certain things that God is going to have locked up until he gets you. Oh, Lord. Am I in the right church? If you get me, you get the gifts. You, can't, you keep trying to get what's in God's hand instead of getting what's in God's heart. And if you go after the heart of God, he'll give you anything in his hand. Oh, y'all not going to talk to me. Y'all act like I don't know what I'm talking about. That's the problem. When you fall on your knees and pray, you don't pray, Lord, let me have more relationship with you. You pray, God, give me more money. Somebody right now, you can't even let God speak to you because you're so distracted with having a husband or having a wife. And God said, if you seek me, I'll give you a spouse. Oh. That man should be so far in God that he has to get through him to get to you. But you make it easy. And so you go from relationship to relationship because you're trying to find something that no man could ever give you. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, I need more of you. Oh, my God, I got to go. We got things to do. He, he sounds mad. I'm not mad. I'm troubleshooting. <laughs> I'm doing an assessment. See, see, Connie, I'm doing an assessment, yeah? You know, they, they wear their hair right, check. Uh-huh. The length on the skirt is right, check. Yeah, 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 yeah. They sing the right things, check. They lift their hands at the appropriate point, yeah, check. I'm, I'm check, check, check. I'm checking all these things. But what the Spirit talked to me this morning and said, the problem is they don't really want me. They said, they don't really want me. They want what I can do for them but they don't really want me. And so sometimes, even with people that are really gifted, you think God wants your gift, but he really don't want your gift. He wants you. The gift is just what he uses to get you. It's the hook in your mouth. So you say, I can really sing. So you get up and sing, but God said, I didn't even want you to sing. I, I didn't need you to sing. In fact, I got angels that fly around my throne all day long. And all they do is sing. I don't need you for that. I needed you. You talking about, well, I'm just not going to come. I'm going to see if the church need me. See how they do without me. God said, I, they didn't need you. <laughs> if you decide not to say nothing, I'll let these cinder blocks cry out. If you're going to sit up here and cry, Elijah, I got hundreds of prophets that have not bowed down to Baal. I didn't need you. I wanted you. And sometimes, because God is so good, sometimes God blessed you with stuff so he can get your attention. Come on, somebody. You wasn't even deserving of it. You knew as raggedy as you were living, you should even have what you have. You shouldn't have that job. You shouldn't have no help. You got a good woman, though you've been a raggedy man. God just blessed you. It was a gift of grace. It was God saying, I know you're crazy, but I'm going to give you this good woman because I want to show you how good I am. Y'all not going to talk to me. You, you weren't even acting right, and I gave you a job anyway. In fact, gave you a promotion because I put the hook in your mouth because what I really wanted was you. So I lift your hands and say, Lord, I want you. I wanted you. I wanted you. And so their eyes had to be open because they needed more of you. Here's the problem. See, my house, if you drop off a package to my house and I wasn't expecting it, there's a strong possibility I'm not going to get it. If you send me something right now, no matter how wonderful it is, if you send me something right now and you didn't tell me it was coming, it's a strong possibility that somebody could steal it. Because I wasn't expecting it. And the only bad thing about that is somebody could steal something from you and you not even know it because you weren't expecting it. You should see what you're missing. You should see what you're missing. For those of you who are struggling with service, with serving God, with giving your life, with becoming a real Christian, you should see the things that the enemy is stealing from you. You should see the things that God has got stacked up for you, just waiting for you to say yes, but the enemy's stealing it off your porch because you're sleepy. <laughs> you're sleepy. You're tired. Isn't it funny? I was talking to somebody about church service, and I said, man, how is it that you can go out there to a football game and sit for two and a half hours <laughs> or more in 30-degree weather and watch a losing team Oops, I, I didn't mean to say that. That just slipped out. 
And you ain't got no problem with that. But you can't spend 45 minutes in church getting something you need for your soul. You know why? Because you don't expect it. You don't know that what God's got waiting for you is bigger than what you thought. In fact, I will say this. What God has in his hand for you is bigger than what you got in your hand right now. That's why you can't give it up. You can't give up the woman. You can't give up the drugs. You can't give up the party. You can't give up whatever it is because you don't know that what God has for you is bigger than what you're trying to give up. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, I give it up. I, I give it up. I give it up. I, I, I give it up. This that I have is a fracture. It's a caricature. And some of you are not concerned, but what you call church is a caricature of church. It is a shadow. It is an edge. It is not even the real thing. And you settle for that. And the enemy's stealing it. So let me go to one, number three, and I'm done. Number three. It's believed that these men that Paul was talking to that they were the original disciples of John the Baptist, right? That actually these were men who had followed John's ministry, and John's ministry was called repenting, the John, baptism of John, all right? That, that was their only point of reference, that John just told them, repent. Repent and be baptized, because he that's coming after me is greater than me. In other words, you weren't supposed to come to me, you were supposed to come through me. And the problem many people is you don't, when you come, you come to the church, but you don't come to him. You come to the preacher. And if the preacher do something wrong, you turned off a church because you came to the church, but you didn't come to God. And John said, the one that's coming after me, I'm baptizing you with water. But the one that's coming after me, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That though you might get a touch and a feel and a shake and shivers and all that, wait, there's more. <laughs> that though you came and Connie sung a song that made you swoon, wait, 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 there's more. I came by the Impact Church and I just stopped by just to see what they was doing, but wait, there's more. There's something deeper, there's something greater, there's something better. Look at somebody say, wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. There's something else in you. There's something else God has for you. Touch somebody and say, wait, there's more. Some people miss out on a deeper experience because they think that what they've been exposed to is all that there is. Oh, I've been to church. I went to my grandmother's church 20 years ago. <laughs> I went to church when I was in Sunday school. I went to church when I was in the Pee Wee League. And that's been your last experience with God. Your last church, your church from 20 years ago, back when Bishop Flip Flap was the bishop. Oh, when Bishop Flip Flap was the bishop. We had church. Because you think that your last experience is all God has. You don't go on to know. You just assume that whatever you know is all there is to know. And God keeps saying, wait, there's more. Look at somebody say, wait, there's more. I guarantee you, whatever you've experienced with God, no matter how great, no matter how high, no matter how wonderful, God is saying there's more. Why are we regressing when God wants us progressing? Oh, y'all not going to talk to me today. Why are we going away from it, acting like God is done, like his pockets are empty, like heaven is bankrupt? Look at somebody say, there's more, there's more, there's higher heights, there's deeper depths, there's something more God wants to show you. And I just came out here to talk to somebody and tell you that God said there is a missing ingredient missing from your life. And I can tell because you're not hungry for it. Oh, there's more. There's more. I told you about Apollos being a great preacher and a great teacher and being an eloquent speaker and persuading many. But the Bible said, but he only had the baptism of John, which basically meant he didn't have the Holy Ghost. He taught, he preached, he ministered, he impressed people, but there was still something missing. And I'm trying to tell somebody, you can have all the cars you want, the houses you want, the women you want, the success you want. But if you ain't got the Holy Ghost like God said you're supposed to have it, there's still something missing. And you shouldn't be satisfied with having all that stuff and not having him. Oh, I'm telling you right now, you shouldn't be satisfied with having a title and a position, but you got no power. 
Lift your hand and say, Lord, give me more. Give me more. I got to take my seat. I'm done. But before I take my seat, somebody lift your hands and say, give me more. Give me more. I'm uncomfortable, Pastor. You preaching too hard. You down my street. I want to make you uncomfortable. I want to upset you. I want to have you walking out of this church today thinking, is it true? I want you to walk out talking to your honey and saying, is it true? I wonder if there's something more. I wonder if there's power that grandma ain't talked about yet. I wonder if there's an anointing that'll flood your soul that'll be so strong that they got to carry you out of here. I wonder if the joy of the Lord is so deep that it goes beyond my outward situation. See, you settle for happiness and God wants to give you joy. Happiness means something has to happen. Happiness. And if as long as the job is good, I'm happy. As long as they ain't laying off, I'm happy. As long as honey ain't acting funny, I'm happy. Something has to happen. But what God wants to give you is joy. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I'm sorry that the saints deceive you. Let me apologize for all the saints in here who deceive you. Because to look at them, you would think, ain't nothing to this. To look at how the saints react to stuff, you would think, "Ain't ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing happening, ain't nothing to this. They're just as crazy as I am. They're just as sad as I am. <laughs> They're just as frustrated as I am. They're just as depressed as I am. When you say Jesus, they say Jesus who? <laughs> but all the real Christians, I want you to identify yourself. All the real Christians who have the joy of the Lord, that like the old church, I don't need a check to get happy. I got the joy. Oh, no. I got joy. I got joy without a drum. I got joy without an organ. I got joy without a singer. I got joy without a check in my pocket. I... Touch about three people around you and say, get you some of this. Get you some of this. The, this that I got will get you through an unemployment situation. This that I got will get you through a bad divorce. This that I got will get you through a bad diagnosis. This that I got will get you through sleepless nights. This that I got, y'all not going to hear me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. Somebody got joy, jump on your feet and give God a shout. Y'all not going to shout. I said, will the real Christians identify yourself? All the real Christians identify yourself. Open your mouth and make some noise and say, I got it. I got it. Have you received the Holy Ghost? Tell somebody, I got it. I I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Find you about three people and say, I got it. I got it. I got it. Like the Bible said, I got it. Like God intended, I got it. Because he sent it, I got it. Look at somebody and prophesy and say, neighbor, I said, neighbor, something's about to hit your house. God sent me to tell you that something's about to hit your house. I raise your expectation. I'm telling you to get ready for it. I'm telling you there's something more. It's been sent from heaven. I got a tracking number. And I come to tell somebody it's on its way. Look at somebody and say, y'all don't believe this. If you believe that someone about to hit your house, you be leaping right now. You be shouting right now. You be dancing right now. You be hollering right now. Something. Something about to hit my house. Is that somebody else saying it's about to hit my house? Oh, yeah. It's about to hit my house. It's about to hit my kids. It's about to hit my pocketbook. It's about to hit my mind. It's about to hit my body. I'm about to be healed in this trumpet. I'm about to get a victory in this trumpet. Oh, my God. Prophesy to somebody say, I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it, I got it. Lay your hands on your belly and say, I got it. I got it. You ain't got to ask me, do I have the Holy Ghost? There's something about a Holy Ghost filled person that you can tell the fake 
from the real thing. Listen, I had a friend of mine that sent me a really expensive gift. And it was really expensive, too. They sent it to me in the mail. You can stand up on your feet. I'm done. They sent it in the mail. And this is what they did. They said, uh, they gave me the heads up and say, hey, I just sent you something. And I wanted to give you the heads up to be on the lookout for it. <laughs> just in case. You're at the store somewhere or out of town. I want you to be on the lookout because I sent you something very expensive. This is what they said. It's going to bless you. It's going to make you smile. It's going to change your life. They didn't tell me what it was. They just told me to be on the lookout for it. And because I knew the caliber of person they was, when they said they were sending a gift, I was sitting there waiting for it. <laughs> Certain people, if they say they're going to send you a little something, something, you know it's going to be a sizable little something, something. So they said, be on the lookout for it. It's about to hit your house. And I come to tell somebody that God sent me as a messenger, as a UPS person, to tell you that something is about to hit your house. That Jesus died and said, I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost. He's already sent it. And I'm asking like Paul, did you receive it? I said, did you receive it? They didn't get it. I said, did you receive it? Look, here's the problem, Charlene. This is what I did that some folks don't do. I stayed and I waited. Because he said it was coming, I believed him. So here's what I did. When I finally got the item, I called him on the phone. And I said, I just want to thank you. They weren't sure if I got it or not. But when I called them up to tell them I got it, I called to tell them thank you because I got, I received what you sent. When I look at the saints today, they don't act like they're thankful that God sent them something. But all the thankful people, all the thankful people, all the glad people, Connie, listen, if I hadn't called them to thank them, they would have been still looking at me like, did they get it? They would have been scratching their head, did they get it? My reaction was a sign that I got what they said. Anybody that got it, open your mouth and give God praise because God said, have you got it? Do you have your joy yet? Yeah. Do you have your peace yet? Yeah. Do you have your victory yet? Yeah. Well, why are you so quiet? Why aren't you clapping your hands? Why aren't you running around this church? I'm confused. I'm confused if you got I'm going to give you one more chance to do this. I want you to take your neighbor by the hand. Mark, stay with me. I want you to take your neighbor by the hand and tell him, neighbor, find you somebody. You can't do this looking at me. Find somebody and tell him, neighbor, in case you don't know, in case nobody told you, in case nobody taught you, this is how you act when somebody blesses you. This is how you act when God sends you a blessing. This is how you act when God gives you a breakthrough. Now go ahead and show them how you're supposed to act. Y'all don't hear me. This is how you act. This is how you act when God. I make no apology for it. I make no excuses for it. This is how you're supposed to act. This is how we're supposed to jam. This is how we're supposed to shout. That's it. Put those hands together. Put those hands together. Put those hands together. Put those hands together.